Hi, Shine. Hello. Yeah, I have I have already joined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello. Yeah, it's visible, sir. Thank you. Hi, a very good evening to all of you. I am Dr. Sayandas from Kolkata, and we are back uh, with class number 26 on our series of lectures in medical physics. And today's topic is proton beam therapy. And for that, we have none other than Dr. Dayanand Sharma, uh, who is the chief of medical physics at the Apollo Proton Center and has been uh, associated uh, with the installation of this uh, uh, proton therapy machine for the first time in our country. So I believe it will be an excellent, I mean, a wonderful experience uh, to listen to him uh, talk about the various aspects of proton beam therapy, as well as share his personal experiences uh, while treating with proton beams. So Dr. Sharma. Okay, thank you, Sain, Dr. Sain. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the Young Radiation Oncology Club for, for having me for this particular talk. And of course, uh, this is the 27 chapters of the CAMS book, but uh, I have prepared this particular lectures by incorporating few uh, case studies which we have carried out in our centers and as well as other relevant uh, literature. Uh, in fact, uh, and uh, in fact, this is a very vast topic. And uh, of course, it's very difficult to cover in one hour, but I will try to, I will try to cover as much as uh, possible, uh, which is relevant to the, to the, the other schedule. But at the same time, um, at the same time, uh, this is a relatively new topic, and uh, I will try to put these lectures as simple as I can. But uh, if there is any uh, misunderstanding or any kind of doubt, I think please feel free to ask me at the end of the talk. Okay, so. Uh, this is going to cover, this lecture is going to cover a wide spectrum related to proton therapy in the clinic, uh, starting from the basic physics and the interactions of protons with uh, matter, then how it is being produced and why we have to use proton therapy in the clinic and what are their best health, 
So what are the benefits of uh, the program directly, how they are produced, and what are the different types of equipment planning and the delivery technique used in program therapy. And uh, finally, I think I will submit some of the, the case studies, uh, case examples uh, to, to, to show the benefits of program therapy. Okay, to begin with, I think let me just try to recap uh, the photon radiation therapy. As all of us know, we have seen a tremendous development okay, in uh, external beam therapy utilizing X rays or high energy X rays or gamma radiations over the last few decades. And uh, now we are able to deliver a very highly conformal dose distributions to the target by employing various, various techniques ranging from three dimensional conformal radiation therapy to image guided IMRT, DMAT, stereotactic radio surgery, then stereotactic radio body radiation therapy, so and so forth. And uh, we are able to do this by using various beam delivery devices. Uh, this is shown in this uh, in this pictures itself. So these are the various commercially available treatment delivery uh, machines, uh, which is currently in use, and most of them are available in India except Viro, uh, which is which has got only two systems across the world. But otherwise, I think we have all these systems available in India. And what we have done, and how we have improved the accuracy and the precision of those delivery from external beam therapy utilizing uh, the X-ray beam is by manipulating or by optimizing the, the radiation full self, radiation full size, and the intensity of the radiations, and of course, uh, by altering the dose fractionation regime. But what has not been same and what remains same in all these modalities over the last many decade is the characteristic of the radiation. So as we know, X-rays are uncharged electromagnetic wave, and, uh, and of course they interact with matter through various processes. And as far as the radiation therapy is concerned, they lose their energy uh, via an indirect process uh, user, uh, through via an indirect process through uh, this quantum scattering mostly predominantly by quantum scattering. And uh, if you track the, the deposition of those along the depth uh, from, from X-ray radiation therapy, then you will see an increase of those with respect to depth till it attains a maximum dose. Then after that, the dose just falls out exponentially. And as we also know that the exponential functions cannot be zero. So that means we cannot stop photon, uh, photon dose. So if you are if you're treating a if you're treating a tumor, if you are treating a tumor using this photon radiation, then you are bound to deliver high dose before it reaches to the tumor. And after depositing the dose to the tumors, also it has to come out. Uh, of the tumor because this is a characteristic of the basic characteristic of the radiation. So one may argue that uh, we can reduce the dose, uh, uh, the, the entrance dose by increasing the number of fills, uh, but you cannot avoid the exit dose. But even if we re increase the number of fills, we can reduce this entrance dose, but this is going to lead into the increase in integral dose. So this is the characteristic of the radiations which cannot be altered. But then the question is, is there any other way wherein we can explore other types of radiation? Okay, so here uh, it comes the charged particle because the charged particle is something which we have not attempted. So now, and the simplest form of charged particle is the, is the proton. And uh, as you know, uh, the proton is the nucleus of the hydrogen atom, which has got a unit charge, uh, unit positive charge, charge of 1.6 into 10 minus per minus 19 Coulomb, having a mass of 1.6 into 10 minus per 27 kg. Okay, and there are different ways. There are various ways uh, a proton can interact with a medium, and uh, the three predominant interactions, which is relevant to the 
uh, photon radiation therapy is inelastic columbic interactions, elastic columbic scattering, and then elastic nuclear interactions. As you can see from these pictures itself, in elastic columbic interactions, the proton path is just deflected, but there is no loss of energy of the incoming proton. And this has got a dosimetric significance or implications in terms of the penumbra. So this will influence the penumbra characteristic of proton beam. And another interaction is the non-elastic nuclear interactions where in the incoming proton directly collide with the nucleus of the, of the interacting medium, uh, interacting medium at home. And this resulted in the, in the emission of recoil nucleus and uh, emission of a proton of uh, reduced energy with a lot of secondary charge and uncharged particle. And uh, the predominant uh, the, the, the predominant charge and uncharged particles are neutrons and the gamma radiation. And these neutrons can have a very wide spectrum of energies ranging from the and the thermal neutron up to the energy of the incoming proton. And this gamma radiation also has got a very high energy up to even 10 uh, MeV. So this leads to a concern, okay, on the on the shielding design. So this has got an implications for the shielding design calculations like over here. So when you have to plan a proton therapy facilities, then you have to calculate the shielding design. And uh, and these shielding designs will be mainly influenced by what kind of neutron and the gamma radiations are emitted because of this non elastic nuclear interaction. And the third interaction, which is very relevant uh, and which is going to form the basis for proton therapy, is the inelastic column interaction. The inelastic column interactions, what it means that when a proton enters in a medium, uh, it interacts with the atom, uh, with, it interacts with the medium through inelastic columbic interactions and it starts. Suppose if I just thread the part of a particular proton beam, then as the proton enters inside the mediums, it produces excitations and ionizations. And these excitations and ionizations leads to the depositions of those over here. And as the, partner, as, a, as the proton beam goes deeper and deeper, then, the, uh, then it loses more and more energies and it reduces its velocity. As it reduces its velocities, then the amount of time the proton spends with the neighboring atoms in the mediums increases. As a result of that, the ionization density along the path of the proton beams increases. And this ionization densities becomes significantly high Okay, uh, when the when the proton velocities is about to approach zero, and this leads to the depositions of a very very high dose almost at the end of the range of the proton, and uh, this leads to the formation of this uh, the the which is called a black pit, and so. So mathematically, so uh, we can also explain the formation of the black peak through the, uh, it can be explained through this uh, the stopping power because the average rate of energy loss of a particle per unit power plant in a medium is also called the stopping power. And if you see the, the, the stopping power, so this the big equation, so just concentrate, just don't concentrate in the entire equation, just look into these two particular parameters the B is the velocity and the Z is the charge. So the, the stopping power is inversely proportional to the, or the energy loss per unit uh, length is inversely proportional to the velocity square. So as the velocity decreases, then the energy loss increases. And as a result of that, I think you have a, uh, you have a uh, higher deposition of those over here. And of course, I think uh, this charge is important, especially when you consider the different types of charged particles. Right now, I think we are considering just hydrogen, so the influencing part is mostly with the velocity. Uh, okay, so this uh, the, this black pit characteristic of the SARS particle forms the basis of or the of, of proton therapy. Or in other words, so this is the rationale. This is one of the, or this is the major rationale for using 
charged particle or proton for the treatment of cancer in external gene therapy. So as you can see over here, for, so the, this brain peak uh, has got a range and beyond that range, there is no dose. So this range, which, is, which corresponds to 90% of the dose at the distal end of the brain peak uh, is defined as the range and the full, uh, this is unique for a particular proton energy. For example, the range of a 230 MeV proton is 32 gram per centimeter square, whereas the range of a 70 MeV proton is just 4.5 gram per centimeter square. So let's look back or let's go back to the same tumor, okay? And uh, so now if you happen to treat this particular tumor using photon radiation therapy, then you learn up and uh, you eradicate a lot of normal tissues prior to releasing the tumor, and even after the tumor also, you eradicate this critical organ. But if you use proton, because of this uh, drag pick characteristic, so you can deposit a much higher dose to the tumor with no dose, literally no dose to the OR, because there is no exit dose from, from proton beam as compared to photon. So another uh, rationale uh, for the proton beam therapy is the is a marginal increase in the radiobiological benefit. And so this is the same present black peak. And if you see the linear energy uh, transfer from this present black peak, what you observe over here is that the LED of a charged particle increases as the particle slow down towards the end of the black peak. And the greater the LED and the greater is the RBE. So, uh, so the the, the RBE of a charged particle is highest at the black peak, and of course, I think it is minimal at the plateau or the entrance region. So this is also another rationale for the use of charged particle or proton for the treatment of cancer in external beam radiation therapy. And of course, the RBE is a very complex function of so many parameters. It depends on the types of radiation. It depends upon the types of charged particle. It depends upon the LED. It depends upon the dose part fractionation, then the, then the cell type, then the, so it is a very, very complex function, but the in vivo dosimetry suggests, or in vivo studies suggest that the RBE of proton may range from 0.7 to 1.5, and uh, universally the RBE, is RBE of proton is considered as 1.1 for, for the dose prescription point of view. So the benefit of proton was uh, the, the benefit of the, the, the use of this Preston Black Peak for the treatment of deep, deep seated tumor was proposed by the physicist Robert Wilson from the University of Harvard in 1946 uh, through his seminal papers published in, uh, in, in, in radiology. So now you can all see over here the radiological use of pulse proton. So this is the first report which proposed the use of Black Peak on a uh, high energy proton beam to treat deep seated tumor. And not only that, uh, the, the Robert Wilson has also proposed that, as you see, the black peak is a, the width of the black peak or the Christian black peak is very narrow. But our tumor is uh, very big in terms of uh, the kind of, uh, in, in terms of the beam, towards the beam direction. So that means you cannot use a the black peak from a single energy to treat a tumor. So to treat such a uh, big tumor, which we generally see in clinic, so you have to superimpose different black peak from different proton energies to split out this width so that you can encompass the, uh, the, the, the tumor extent. Okay, so this is what we call the split of black peak. And uh, Robert will, will show me in his and in this paper also have proposed how to split out the black peak by using a rotating wheel. So this is the beginning of uh, a proton therapy. And unfortunately, the first patient was not treated in his home institute, Harvard University, because the cyclotron was not available at that point of time. But the first patient uh, uh, was treated with proton therapy from in the uh, the Berkeley University or Berkeley Laboratories uh, in, in uh, 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 because here I think you can see over here, this is the team led by 
Topias, and they have treated the first patient. And the second author over here is Lawrence, who have developed the, uh, who have patented the cyclotron for the medical application. Okay, so the first patient was treated in 1954 in LDL, and, uh, and that was a case of CA breast, uh, and uh, uh, the primary uh, metastasis CA breast, but the protocol treatment was done for the, the pituitary gland for, uh, to suppress the hormone. And of course, at that point of time, the, uh, the bony landmarks on the planar radiograph was used to target the BIM. And they didn't even use the, the black pit. They simply have used the plateau of the, the plateau of the Christian black pit uh, using a cross-firing technique. So this was the first report on the use of proton therapy uh, for the treatment of cancer patients. Uh, and if you see the progress of proton therapy, I think I would say that compared to external, compared to the conventional uh, photon radiation therapy, the progress of proton therapy is uh, very slow. Uh, one of the reasons uh, uh, is, I think, because most of the proton therapy was carried out in a very well-controlled research trial in, in some of the physics and the nuclear physics laboratories, not in a clinical uh, hospital, or in a, not in a clinical setup, till Loma Linda, start, Loma Linda Medical Centers started the first proton therapy in around 1990. So you can see over here, uh, after 1990, then the number of proton therapy facilities across the world has increased significantly. And at the same time, the number of patients treated, treated with proton therapy has increased significantly. Uh, but still, compared to uh, photon radiation therapy, the numbers, the percentage of patients treated with proton therapy uh, was very, very less. It's around less than 2%. One of the major reasons is the cost-benefit ratio. And uh, always then there has been a heated debate in, even in the scientific meeting and even in all these uh, uh, high impact factor peer review journals, there is a lot of debates related to the cost-benefit ratios. And those who are interested can go to all this uh, article related to the cost-benefit ratios of uh, photon therapy. But in the recent two, uh, in the recent past, especially in the last two decades, I think uh, there is a tremendous interest from in the proton therapy, as can be seen from the from the from this evidence. Like now, you can see over here the number of publications. Uh, have increased exponentially in the last two decades. At the same time, the number of installations uh, across the world has increased significantly. As so when we when we when we uh, when Apollo decided to have the first proton therapy in 2012, that time there were only 36 centers across the world. Now the latest report shows that there are around 109 centers across the world, uh, and the 37 centers are under construction, and the 29s are. And are uh, considering to uh, plan uh, radiation therapy. So one of the reasons why uh, uh, there is a uh, there is a uh, there is a uh, there is a uh, in great interest in the proton therapy is of course the, the development in the technology and of course the availability of low low cost proton therapy. Uh, and what do you require to 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 have a proton therapy? So, so this is the proton therapy uh, architecture. So first of all, you have to have a system or, uh, or you have to produce the proton beam and accelerate the proton beam. So that is what we call the beam production system. And then as I already pointed out, the, any tumor cannot be treated by a single proton energy. They have to be treated by multiple proton energies. So, you, uh, so this proton energy has to be selected very precisely. So then, for then, I think you will have an energy selection system. And uh, these protons are generated somewhere, and the treatment will be done somewhere. So uh, you have to have a beam transport system from the, from the uh, proton uh, production system to the treatment delivery room. And, uh, and of course, I think you will have all the other beam positioning systems and uh, patient uh, verification system. And uh, uh, since it is a very, very complicated system, then you have to have a very robust and uh, uh, the therapy uh, safety system. And everything will be, of course, controlled through the therapy control system. So I will try to touch this component in the coming uh, slides.
So as you know, I think this is the proton. Okay. So how we are? So this is the hydrogen atom. So let's consider a, a, a highly pure hydrogen gas. Okay. So from uh, in there you have all these hydrogen atoms. So once you strip out of the, the, this electron, then this becomes a proton. Okay. And uh, to accelerate this proton to a uh, energy of up to 230 to 250 MeV, which is uh, required uh, for the treatment of cancer in clinic, then you have to accelerate them by subjecting to a very high electric uh, potential difference, which is of the order of around 230 to 250 million volt. Okay, million volt. But the highest man met voltage ever achieved is around only 25 million volt. Then so how do we achieve this 10 times increase in the voltage? Definitely we cannot achieve it because this is the this is the uh, this is the highest voltage which can be produced uh, 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 which can be produced uh, so but the requirement is 10 times higher than this. So then how do we achieve this? Then then idea comes, then instead of subjecting to such a high potential difference, what you do is that you subject it or you accelerate a proton to a lesser potential difference, which is approximately around 50 kilovolt, and then you do it multiple times. Like say, for example, to achieve 250, you have to accelerate uh, this particular proton within this potential difference of 50 uh, kilovolt for 50,000 times. Okay, to accept this required proton energy. Okay, and the first thing which we which it comes to in our mind is the linear accelerator. Okay, which was I mean studied in uh, in around 1920. And uh, as you know, I, over here, so in these are the cavities uh, inside the linear tube, and uh, so you apply a differential potential difference over here and you inject a proton beam through these sources and by altering the potential difference to these uh, uh, cavities, you can accelerate the charge particle in the gap, uh, in this particular gap. And uh, as it accelerates, as, the, as this proton gains more and more energies, it travels faster and faster. So, it, so you have to increase the length of these particular cavities, okay? Uh, so, so this will keep on increasing. The, the, the cavity the, of the linear tube will keep on increasing. And that if you do like this, in order to accept a clinical proton energy of up to 230 MeV, then this becomes very impractical. So you require approximately 37 meter length linear accelerator to accept uh, to accept a proton energy of 230 MeV or 250 MeV. This is not practically possible. So the use of linear accelerator to accelerate a proton beam is not feasible because of the substantial uh, or impractical long uh, linear tube. Then at that point of time, another physicist by the name uh, uh, okay, came out uh, with the proposal okay, uh, of of accelerating the charge particle in uh, accelerating the charge particle in a circular manner, okay. And Lawrence in 19, of course, the work was uh, started. Uh, the work the, the work was going on between 1929 to 1930, but it was patented in 1932. So he came up with the concept of accelerating the charge particle in a circular fashion instead of a linear fashion. And uh, what he proposed was. You uh, you put you accelerate the charge particle uh, inside a magnetic field, and how it is going to how it is going to accelerate is so. For example, I have the proton over here, okay, which was injected with an initial velocity and with an initial energy, and uh, he has uh, chosen two semicircular set hollow metal. Uh, structures okay so inside this is its hollow and uh, and then he maintained a gap of, of few uh, few distance over here and he uh, positioned the charge particle at the center of this gap 
and he applied a potential difference across this gap and uh, he can accelerate the charged particle within this particular gap again and again and again till it achieve a uh, till it achieve the required energy then how do we do that so, so this and uh, so this is the magnetic field and uh, so in between this magnetic field he kept the d's we call it d's and the these these are applied with an alternating uh, voltage or alternating current over here and the stars uh, the proton is injected with certain energies over here so when the charge uh, the, the this is injected with a certain energy so this will be attracted towards the these depending upon the polarity say for example at this point suppose if it is a uh, if this plate is charged with uh, negative and uh, this plate sorry this charge plate is charged with negative and uh, this is positive so this will repel this proton and uh, this will attract this proton so the proton will come towards this side the since it is subjected within this magnetic field that it will be acted by this particular force which is given by charge uh, into velocity into into the strength of the magnetic field and since it has to rotate around this around the circle then it has to uh, maintain the, the it has to maintain the uh, with the with the lorentz force so this lorentz force which is given by m squared by r and uh, and uh, the, the qvb has to be equal and from this you can find out the radius i think on which the charge will be accelerated and then this particular charge will be accelerated with an angular frequency given by this equation uh, which is q the charge in, uh, multiplied by the magnetic field strength divided by the mass of the charged particle and so this way uh, the charge will be rotated the proton will be rotated at various radius across the these but at the same time each time the charge pass through this these through the gap of this these the this uh, particle is going to gain energy so this is the initial force uh, which the charge particle was having and uh, so this is the corresponding energy and at this time this particular uh, charge particle crosses this these then it is going to gain twice the amount of this energy which is given by twice charge into electric and the, 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 the gap over here. So the, the charge particle kept on increasing uh, its uh, energy and it kept on increasing its energy and it will do this till it attains the maximum energy of the proton. So this is a its energy accelerator and they are basically designed to accelerate the charge particle up to an energy of approximately 250 mAh. So once you attain this particular energy, then you can take it out from the cyclotron, and it can be uh, the energy can be reduced outside the cyclotron to meet the clinical requirement. So this is the pictures of the prototype cyclotron, which was developed by Lawrence in uh, in 1932, and uh, which was able to accelerate uh, a proton of up to 80 keV. And this was the size of this cyclotron was just like a 10 inch. But the medical cyclotron, which we use nowadays, has got uh, uh, various diameter. And so depending on, I mean, how you uh, handle with the charge of that particular, because as you know, I think the angular frequency of that charge particle is uh, is Q, Q charge, the magnetic field upon the, the mass of the, the mass of the, the proton. So depending on how you treat or how you interpret the mass, then this angular frequency is going to sense. So uh, for low energy proton, which is up to 25 MeV, so we consider that the, the increase in the mass is almost constant, which is approximately 1.03. And uh, this kind of cyclotron which works under, uh, by considering the mass remains constant is called the original or the classical cyclotron and this is the one which is used mostly in the radio pharmaceutical production and another type of cyclotron is called the synchro cyclotron so in this what happens is that if you if we know that 25 mv is not sufficient uh, or it is nowhere closer to the 
the requirement of radiation therapy because we require proton ranging from around 70 MeV to 230 MeV. So it is no point closer to our clinical requirement. So you have to further increase the energy of the proton. And the, when you increase, what we are increasing, we are increasing the kinetic energy. So you cannot increase the velocity of the charged particle beyond the velocity of light. So as a result, so you, you, the mass has to increase yeah, according to the Einstein's theory of relativity. So when the mass started increasing, so you can see over here, when the mass started increasing, then your angular frequency is going to decrease because they are inversely proportional. So in order to keep this, uh, uh, the proton accelerating in that particular radius, then you have to adjust the, the, the radio frequency, the external radio frequency in such a way that this angular momentum get decreased, uh, okay, to, to uh, sorry, this angular momentum get increased to balance the increase in the mass. So this kind of cyclotron is called synchrocyclotron. Okay, and another way of doing or achieving the angular or making the uh, angular frequency constant is by increasing the magnetic field. So in this case, uh, so as the mass increases, you also increase the magnetic field strength proportional to the increase in the mass, so that the the increase in the mass and the increase in the magnetic field cancel out each other to maintain a constant angular frequency. So such type of cyclotron which works under this kind of principle is called isochronous cyclotron. And uh, the one what we have at Apollo Proton Cancer is an example of an isochronous cyclotron, where in we, we have a variable magnetic field ranging from 1.7 to 2.15 Tesla in order to maintain this uh, angular frequency. Uh, this cyclotron, if you if you want to increase the energy of the proton beyond 250 MeV, then uh, then this becomes an issue. The cyclotron becomes an issue because you have to increase the size of the magnet in order to increase the size in order to increase the proton wave. So this becomes uh, almost impractical because you have to create a huge magnetic field. Of course, there are different ways to do it. You can use a superconducting magnet. Or otherwise, if you are using for a room temperature magnet, then the size of the magnet will be very bulky and it will be very, very heavy. Because the, uh, so this can be overcome by distributing the magnetic field in a bigger diameter, in a smaller component. And this is done in synchrotron. Okay, the first synchrotron was designed uh, in Fermi lab, uh, and this was installed at Loma Linda University for the treatment of cancer. So in synchrotron, what uh, basically you require is, first of all, you, you require a linear accelerator, okay? Uh, so I have a proton source over here, and this proton source is accelerated inside this linear accelerator up to an energy of 2 to 7 MeV, depending upon the, the design of the synchrotron. And this, uh, this proton, uh, these two to seven MeV protons are accelerated in the same circular fashion, and, uh, and each time this proton completes one, uh, one rotation, that it is going to gain its energy. So to keep the uh, proton in the same radius, then you have to keep on increasing the strength of the magnetic field, which is which is distributed uh, uh, in this in this uh, circle. Okay, so you have to keep on increasing the magnetic strength of the magnetic field in, as the energy of the proton get accelerated higher and higher in this uh, circular part. So the, the two commercial systems which are based on uh, the, the synchrotrons are from Hitachi and the Mitsubishi. And uh, of course, you can see over here, the size of a synchrotron is much more, much bigger than, than the size of a cyclotron. Okay, because first of all, you require an accelerator, then after that, you have to distribute this, uh, uh, this uh, magnet in a big diameter of uh, the ring. So this is the, I think this is very complicated. This I think I would avoid uh, because first of all, the size of the size of the synchrotron is going to be, uh, synchrotron is going to be much, much bigger compared to 
the cyclotron. And then again, in cyclotrons, isochronous cyclotrons are relatively bigger compared to compared to simple cyclotron. And uh, and uh, of course, I think uh, in the advantage of synchrotron is you can extract any kind of beam what you want. So but in case of cyclotron, what you do is that you get a fixed maximum energy from there. You have to degrade the energy of the proton based on your theoretical requirement. So during this process, a lot of, uh, as I said, I think a lot of neutrons and the gamma radiations are produced. So this is a concern from the radiation safety point of view. But otherwise, uh, uh, otherwise, I think cyclotrons are a very stable and a very simple uh, accelerator compared to compared to synchrotron. So I will not go into the details, uh, uh, technical details, because it is going to take a lot of time. So there are two ways uh, of delivering proton. Uh, so one is called uh, multi-room solutions, wherein you have an accelerator. Uh, which is a cyclotron in this example, and uh, which produce the proton beam, and uh, that is being supplied to the to the various treatment rooms. So this is called a multi-room uh, system. So here in this case, we have two treatment rooms. This is of gantry and the one fixed room. But uh, to 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 have uh, to make the proton therapy available uh, at a lesser cost, then the industry has come up with a single room solution wherein you have a cyclotron and then you have a treatment room. So you can see over there, the footprint is reduced significantly and, uh, and uh, the, the construction cost is going to reduce significantly. The equipment costs are reduced significantly and the maintenance become relatively simple. So this is a, uh, what I call, uh, this is an approach, to, uh, low cost approach to make the proton therapy available across the world. But in the multi-room facilities, this is how it looks like. So we have the cyclotron over here, isochronous cyclotron over here. So we inject hydrogen gas, highly pure hydrogen gas inside the cyclotron. The electrons are stripped out and it is accelerated inside the cyclotron till it attains a maximum energy of 230 MeV. Once it attains 230 MeV, then it is extracted out of the cyclotron and uh, they are focused by using the contraphone wavelength. So you can see over here, this area, which is called uh, the energy selection system is full of uh, dipole magnet and the quadrupole magnet. And these dipole magnets are basically used to deflate the beam, whereas the quadrupole magnets are used to focus the beam. Okay, so the electrons, so the proton, which is coming out of the cyclotrons, are intentionally degraded by using a beam degrader shown over here. Okay, so, so, so it is something like a, the weights. So by using different thickness of the waves, you can attenuate the proton beam at different uh, level. So if you if you want a high low energy beam, then you have to insert a thicker portion of this beam degrader. So by when doing that, as I said, I think it produces a lot of neutrons and the gammas. So you have to you have to ensure or you have to quantify the ambient neutron and the proton uh, photon dose across the facilities, which we have done in our center. And you can refer to these papers if you are interested to read uh, what is the radiation environment around such kind of facilities. Okay, so once the beam is degraded based on your requirement, like I think you can degrade from 70 MeV uh, up to 70 MeV at any interval. And this mono energetic proton beam has to be selected from this particular area called the energy selection system. And of course, there is a lots of uh, filter, uh, like in the form of slits. That there is lots of beam monitoring systems along this path, which I am not going to uh, discuss in detail. So the mono energetic beams are selected from here, and it is transported all the way to the treatment room to this beam transport system. So now this is the way how the beams comes to the treatment one of the treatment rooms. So the cyclotron. Then the energy selection cycle, energy selection system, then the mono energetic western drag picks are bended to various locations and uh, by using the bending magnet, and it comes through this uh, location called this area called the uh, this is the treatment delivery room, and this uh, device is called the visuals, and this is the beam delivery system. Okay, and so uh, and this is how it looks like inside the treatment room. So this nozzle or uh, the beam delivery system is very crucial that depending on that, I think 
we are going to determine what kind of treatment, what kind of sophistications in the treatment delivery, proton treatment delivery systems you have in your center. So, as I said, the beam delivery system, okay, which is the which is located in these nozzles, uh, it can be basically so it can be uh, by using passive scattering or the active scattering or active scan. So this is the Preston break field, what we have discussed. As we already discussed that the width of this Preston bit is very narrow. Okay, so we have to broaden it out. So this can be done by using a passive scattering technique, okay, or by using a active scanning technique. Okay, and when we do so, when we split out the break bit, say by uh, either by using a passive scattering or active scattering, then you also have to uh, look at these parameters. Like initially, the, the plateau to pick ratio was very high over here. That means there was very less intense dose and very high dose to the tumor. But when you split out this ratio, the pick to plateau ratio get decreased. So in this example, it is decreased from 4.5 is to 1, 2, 2 is to 1. So this will depends upon the, the size of the tumor and the depth of the tumor. Okay. So so this split out break field can be achieved by using this passive scattering. And in this case, it is an example of double scattering technique. So this is the proton wave which you get it from the cyclotron. And so by introducing a scatter, okay, we intentionally broaden this beam out, just like just like what we do in case of electron. Okay. And so by again, we introduce another scatterers over here. So by introducing these two scatter. Uh, that is why we call it double scattering. So you can scatter the beam or you can broaden the beam by approximately 25 by 25 centimeter square. Uh, so it is a broad beam. So from a pencil beam, you are making a broad beam by using these two scatter. Okay. And this is my patient and this is the, my tumor. Okay. And to set the dose distributions in the lateral directions, then you have to collimate the beam. So that collimation is done by using this kind of uh, the patient specific and the field specific beam aversion, just like our three dimensional uh, conformal block, which we used to use prior to a multi -loop collimator. Okay. And uh, in proton, there is another dimension, which is the longitudinal dimension, which is controlled by the energy of the proton field. So you need to get a conformal dose distribution towards the longitudinal directions also. So that is achieved by, uh, by, by, by using a three-dimensional tissue compensator, uh, which is made up of tissue equivalent material. So for instance, in this case, it is acrylic. Okay. So you have to use this kind of uh, field specific beam aperture and the tissue compensator to get a conformal dose distributions to the target. But at the same time, to modulate or to split out the break bit, you have to use a range modulator over here to have this kind of different Preston break bit. So by combining all this, then you can get a conformal dose distributions to the target. But even after that also, the conformation of the dose towards the target is good in the distal direction, but it is there is a spillage of dose towards the proximal direction. You can see over here. So this is one of the main limitations for the passive scattering or double scattering technique. And uh, this and the PIP and the and the, uh, the the proton therapy center used to treat their patient by using this kind of passive scattering technique either in a sitting position or in a sleeping position by using all this kind of uh, patient specific and uh, and uh, field specific accessories uh, which has to be fabricated uh, in your facilities. And uh, when these are exposed with the proton beam and the, all these accessories becomes contaminated with the neutron and the, this becomes an issue from the disposal points of view. So this has got a lots of issues related to related to uh, the logistically as well as from radiation safety point of view and also dosimetrically it is inferior because there is an experience of those in towards the proximal direction. Okay. However, this particular technique is considered to be very robust. Okay, 
uh, but this all these things can be overcome with the use of with the use of uh, active scan or the pencil beam scanning technique so in this case what you do is that you remove all those accessories out and what you retain is just a pairs of scanning magnet okay so this is the same proton beam which you, which you are getting from the cyclotron to the beam transport system so you remove everything out and just retain only two pairs of magnetic field one magnet because since proton is a charged particle you can deflect the part of the proton beam easily by applying various magnetic field strength to this magnet so one mag one pair of magnet will scan the proton beam or will deflect the proton beam along the x direction whereas another pair of magnet will deflect the proton beam in y direction so this is the same patient the same tumor the same beam uh, but the so we have replaced the whole things with these pairs of magnet and uh, the way how it is going to be treated is so now you consider that this tumor is divided into different slices okay and this slice is located at a particular depth from the body of the patient or from the beam entry surface of the patient so that means this layer has to be treated by a particular proton energy the farthest layer will be treated with a higher energy then when it comes to this layer then the energy of the proton will be reduced when it comes to this layer it will be further reduced and the, the shallowest layer will be treated with the least energy okay and in this layer so this layer will be represented by a uh, if you would see the by a box shell and in that box shells you are going to position the black pit so this is the black pit which you are uh, of a particular proton energy which you have positioned in this area and uh, in this you can see that it has positions only to the tumor while skipping or while avoiding the the critical organ which is located in this area so so then if you come to the next uh, next energy layer and then you can the entire target so with this what you get is a mass conformal or dose distributions compared to double scattering technique and at the same time you avoid all those uh, patient and the field specific hardware so this is the facilities in our center so we have a three room solution and this is uh, the latest proton therapy facilities available in the world today and we have a three room solutions two with the rotating gantry and one with the fixed room fixed beam room and uh, this is exclusively for pencil beam scanning technique so we have not planned for double scattering technique and uh, the image guidance unlike the all proton therapy centers here we have uh, we have uh, the image guidance in all possible uh, manner like 2d 2.5d and including 3d in the form of one beam cd so all of the form beam cd have been implemented in the in the photon radiation therapy the the quad beam ct is relatively new in proton beam uh, okay but uh, we do have the one beam ct in our facilities and uh, we do have a robot okay uh, uh, which will be able to position the patients uh, and the correct the patients in six dimension in conjunction with the the, uh, the image registration software available with the system and of course we do have a motion management uh, technique uh, using the 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 surface scanning okay and uh, you one can refer the characterization so how what kind of acceptance test what kind of performance evaluation has to be carried out before we implement it uh, for the clinical application so those details you can refer to these papers which we published very recently so like any other radiation therapy department i think you have to integrate all this proton therapy with all the imaging modalities like in this case we have a it 5 cm wide board ct scan multi slice ct scan a 3d sli mri and a digital pet ct to to for the accurate target and the non target structure delineation and we have the ray station treatment planning systems which supports both analytical dose calculations and the monte carlo dose calculations algorithms and uh, and so so you you set uh, and uh, and uh, we use uh, oncology a mosaic as an oncology information system so if we talk about the workflow the workflow what we flow follow in proton radiation therapy is very much similar to the workflow what we follow in photon radiation therapy however 
there are some differences like the adaptive radiation therapy is is almost a routine in proton radiation therapy this is not the case in photon radiation therapy but the way how we execute or the way how we approach to this and every steps of this process is completely different or is different the reason the, the why it is different is because of this uncertainty uh, because of this uncertainty not only for proton all sars part particles are vulnerable to this kind of uncertainties which is there in case of proton radiation therapy also but this uncertainties are i mean the protons are more sensitive to this kind of uncertainties compared to photon radiation therapy so we have to approach this and every steps of our treatment planning and the delivery process differently compared to photon and of course we should understand how to mitigate all this uncertainty uh, which i am not going to discuss in detail because it is a very very lengthy topic uh, but we uh, we have to approach this and every steps differently and very carefully because the the sars particles are more vulnerable to this kind of uncertainties uh like uh, like we have 3d crt imrt and the bmat and all in proton radiation therapy also we have two approach uh, for treatment planning one is called the single pill uniform dose uh, where in this treatment will deliver a uniform dose to the target and of course if you combine all of them together then you deliver the homogeneous dose to the target but in case of multi fill optimization this will deliver a heterogeneous dose to the target but if you combine all of them together the resultant dose distribution to the tumor is homogeneous so this is what we call the multi fill optimization so these are the two approach which we use and uh, and uh, uh there is a new approach which has been uh, uh, introduced very recently which is called the uh, robust optimization the reason being uh, in case of photon radiation therapy we create a ptv margin to take into account of the uncertainties incurred during the entire process radiation therapy process but in proton radiation therapy uh, the, 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 there are several arguments which says and even literature which says that the ptv doesn't have a uh, ptv concept cannot be implemented directly implemented in in proton radiation therapy because of the lens uncertainties so the robust optimization is a new concept which has been implemented in proton radiation therapy wherein we incorporate set of error and the lens uncertainties during the treatment planning process okay during the treatment planning optimization and we accept or we try to the optimizer try to converts into a solutions where uh, it gives a solutions where in the the the, the resultant dose distribution is less sensitive to the set of error and uh, and uh, and the lens uncertainties so and uh, accordingly we also have to evaluate the treatment plan uh, robustness and uh, so the robust evaluate robust optimization and the robust evaluation is a new approach uh, which is in, in which is applicable and which is commonly used in proton radiation therapy especially using pencil beam scanning technique uh, which is not the case in photon radiation therapy and of course i think of course i think the the benefit i think we have already seen since we can we can since we can stop proton wherever we want then definitely we can reduce the dose to the oer and we can reduce the integral dose and this is going to reflect in the reduction of toxicity profile and since we can reduce the toxicity profile then you have a possibility of dose escalations and even you can also avoid or reduce the radiation induced carcinogenesis which is a function in radiation therapy and finally your outcome has to be better or or comparable at least comparable with the with the existing modalities so the classical way to evaluate or to demonstrate the advantage of proton therapy or the proton stops wherever we want is the irradiation of the craniospinal excess irradiation as you can see over here this is a uh, pedretic uh, medullo uh, medulloblastoma so this plan is with the proton and this plan is with the photon 
So whatever the modality you use, whether uh, in BMAT or a conventional 3D CRT, so the exit dose is unavoidable from, from photon. But since we can stop proton wherever we want, so we can control the dose to all these uh, uh, the structures which is lying anterior to the target. So this is the dose difference which you will be delivering from any form of photon radiation therapy compared to compared to proton. And of course, there are several studies which demonstrate the, the reduction of all these critical organs, around 18 critical organs from proton therapy compared to photon. And uh, if you use this dosimetric data into a model, and you can predict, uh, the model predict that there is going to be a, a lower, or there is going to be a lower pneumonitis rate, lower cardiac failure rate, lower xerostomia, lower blindness, the hypothyroidism and the autotoxicity. At the same time, it is also going to reduce the radiation induced carcinogens. Even in our centers also, we have treated quite a good number of uh, 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 the, the CSI, uh, both for pediatric and the adult. And uh, so these are some of the representative dose distributions from our centers. And uh, we have uh, reported, I think the papers, two papers are under review right now about one is about the technicality because the technique what we have implemented over here is different than what it is uh, available in the literature. And at the same time, we also have investigated in case if there is any kind of unforeseen uh, error during the time of treatment delivery, what kind of uh, implications it may have uh, to those patients who are treating with uh, photon radiation therapy. So these papers are under, uh, and uh, the outcome, the clinical outcome, the, the short-term short clinical outcome has been reported very recently for all the young and the adult patients treated in our centers. And uh, you can refer to this particular paper, which was published by our team uh, led by Srinivas uh, very recently in JCO. And of course, since you can reduce the dose to this critical organ, so you can scale the dose. And uh, one typical example where in the advantage of dose escalation is, or the dose escalation needed is for those tumors which is considered to be more radio resistant. So in this case, this is an example uh, of, uh, of secular trauma which we have treated in our center. So it was a very complicated case. The patient was not able to even lie down either in supine or prone position. And so we treated the, these patients in an inclined position, and you can see over here that all these critical organs are very well protected. At the same time, we have delivered up to, uh, around 74 grade to the tumor uh, uh, using the pencil wing scanning technique. Okay, and uh, and of course uh, the the reduction of uh, the radiation-induced carcinogenesis can be even evident from these publications, which is a uh, uh, which is I mean. Wherein I think the around 558 patients of proton treated at NGAs and 558 patients of uh, uh, young patients uh, of, of treated with uh, photon radiation therapy in other institutes were, uh, were evaluated and the radiation induced carcinogenesis were evaluated for the two arms. And they found that there is a significant reduction in the radiation induced carcinogenesis treated with proton compared to photon radiation therapy. And uh, of course, the significant improvement in the, in the clinical outcome also was reported uh, from one of the two leading proton institutes, uh, PSI in Switzerland and also in France, where in, I think, quite a good number of patients, 251, uh, randomized for what uh, proton and the photon. And uh, you can see over there, the five year, the seven year overall survival was around 93.6%. And the seven year toxicity free survival was around 84.2%. So, a very encouraging data from proton radiation therapy. And of course, uh, uh, the, 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 the dose calculation algorithms play a very important role. And this is our own data wherein we have evaluated the, the accuracy of what analytical dose calculation in the Monte Carlo. And we found that. That the analytical dose calculation algorithms available in base stations was limited, especially when we use a particular uh, uh, device called the vent shifters at the cellular depth. And uh, 
and the, this is uh, in accordance with other publications from other centers where you can see over here your analytical dose calculations algorithms can be up by up to 50 percent compared to the Monte Carlo algorithms and uh, of course the Monte Carlo algorithms available at Ray Station has been validated with the uh, research model uh, Monte Carlo algorithm a uh, Monte Carlo port like gen 4 and uh, MC square and uh, it agrees very well compared to all these research model. So that means the Monte Carlo algorithms available in base station is quite accurate, uh, but whereas the pencil beam or the analytical dose calculations algorithms, you have to be very, very careful, especially when you are dealing with a heterogeneous medium. And uh, so this is an example which uh, can demonstrate the advantage of Monte Carlo. Uh, so this is a case uh, you can see over here. So this is a, a nasal cavity. You have a lots of ear cavities over here. So if you do the optimizations and the calculations using the analytical dose calculation algorithm, you see that the, the target is very well covered by your prescription isodose line. But this is not what it is going to deliver on the patient. So if you do the optimization using the Monte Carlo and the calculate with analytical dose calculations, you see that the, your target which seems to be covered adequately by your prescription isodose line is not actually covered, okay? Uh, but this can be improved if you apply or if you use Monte Carlo, what for optimization as well as calculations. So you can see over here that there is a significant improvement. So this is, this is the actual dose which you are going to deliver on the patient. But if you happen to do it with the analytical dose distributions, uh, analytical dose calculations that you are Bound to deliver a, a different dose than what it is seen on your computer. As I said, the, uh, the adaptive planning is very usual in uh, uh, very usual in uh, in proton radiation therapy. So you can see over here during the time of uh, our tre uh, treatment planning simulation, uh, the the this nasal cavity was open. So accordingly, we have created a dose distribution like this. And during the treatment planning, the, so there is more filling of the nasal cavities, which leads to the reduction of dose to this particular or under dose of the dose to this area of the target volume. So uh, uh, routinely, what we do is that uh, we do a, some sort of QACT on a weekly basis, uh, which is triggered by our quantum CT. And uh, we uh, the, uh, we do the adaptive re planning based on the dosimetric difference uh, between the and original treatment plan and the, the treatment deliver on subsequent fractions. And of course, the, the, uh, the, the recurrence or the re-irradiation is considered to be one of the biggest challenges in radiation therapy and we are likely to see uh, such kind of patients because the survivors are increasing and uh, when the survivors are increasing, then definitely I think the patient is likely to come back uh, for the second irradiation. Uh, okay, so this is one example uh, which we have treated in our center, a young lady uh, where, who, who was irradiated almost three years back for the, for the nasal cavity. So you can see over here, we have to deliver a dose of uh, 60 gram to this CTV. And at the same time, we have to restrict the dose to this optic nerve uh, uh, to a maximum dose of nine gram. So we ran a competitive plan between protons and the TOMO. So this is the dose distributions from the TOMO. And to respect the dose to this uh, optic nerve to nine gray, then there is a significant under dose to this part of the, to, uh, to the target, okay? And the, with the proton uh, um, IMPT or intensity modulated proton therapy, so we are able to deliver the curable dose or the prescription dose to the tumor while respecting the dose to this, uh, to this optic nerve. So you can see over here, so this is the extra dose which we are able to deliver to the tumor on the proton beam, and we are able to reduce the dose to all these critical organs. And you can see over here from the dose volume histogram cells over there. Uh, if you try to, uh, uh, so even, even, with, uh, even with a very less dose of uh, around a million dose of so D99 of, of say around 28 gray, to the tumor, the optic of dose is still 14.86. But by delivering a therapeutic dose of 56 gray to the tumor, we are able to, the proton plant, 
is able to restrict the dose to the optic nerve to less than 10 grams. This is our clinical goal. So, so this clearly indicates that the prolonged therapy is a very good indication for weak irradiations to, to where, wherein we have a very tight constraint for the for the critical organ. At the same time, we have to reduce the, the integral dose. So a little bit of physics. So the dosimetric equipment and EQA equipment, what we use for proton beam therapy is slightly different than that of photon. So we will not go into the details of all this, but the dosimetric equipments are different. And the, the way the parameters are verified are also different. So, so this is our uh, this example of our morning QA. Uh, so where in, so we have used this kind of centimeter, we have used this kind of uh, solid phantoms, and you have to set this many number of parameters. So you can see over here. So you have to set more than 15 parameters on daily basis. Okay. And uh, which we do it regularly, and uh, we follow recently a task group uh, have come up from double APM, and uh, we follow the task group. When we started, there was no task group, but now we do have a task group. And uh, before prior to uh, this task group, uh, then we started following this kind of uh, what they call the quality assurance. Now, this is the results for the for the over, over a period of time for one of the machine, uh, which I think I will not. Uh, Discuss now in the interest of the time. And uh, so these are the reasons which we got it over a period of time. I think now we are almost, uh, we are going to have, we are going to complete almost two years now. So these are the reasons uh, from one of the patients for, for the last uh, 15, 16 months. And uh, the patient specific QA, like uh, you do for the IMRT or BMED. So the patient specific QA is very crucial over here. And unlike uh, photon radiation therapy, wherein we do the patient-specific QA at a particular depth, here we have to do the patient-specific QA at multiple depths because we have because the protons are very sensitive to the the proton uh, the lens or the depth. So we have to verify at multiple depths. So we use a different device to do that, and we verify it at multiple depths. Okay, per field. Okay, so for example. Uh, right now, we started with five depths per field. Now we verified at least three depths per field. And this is the result. Okay, these are the results over the period of time. And you can see over here uh, what the, the, the passing rate uh, over the period of time. So, in majority of the cases, the, the gamma value was above 97%. But we do see some, uh, in some patients, the gamma value was fell. And uh, the, it was not passing the criteria, and uh, we have to recreate the plan, and we have to redo the QA, and uh, till we verify or to, till we uh, satisfy the result. Okay, so we do see uh, situations or the treatment plan where the where it was not pass the criteria. Okay, and of course the artifact is the presence of metal is a big challenge in proton therapy, and we have come up with our own innovative solutions to deal or to mitigate this kind of issues by using various uh, uh, mitigation strategies in the form of uh, different types of algorithms to reduce the artifact, to reduce even including the use of MDCD into the treatment, uh, into the treatment planning process and, uh, and a series of in vivo dosimetry uh, using films. And uh, of course, I think. With the pencil beam scanning technique, the spectrum of clinical cases which is approved by various authorities in different countries has increased significantly. In the when the double scattering technique was used, only few clinical sites was eligible for the proton. But now with the pencil beam scanning technique, you can see over here you can treat almost all clinical sites with proton beam, uh, keeping the keeping the cost issue aside. So, uh, so this is the great team which we work together over there to achieve this milestone. And of course, we have a long way to go. And we are the first JCI accredited cancer center in India. And we are very proud for that. And uh, thank you for your kind attention. Thanks a lot, Dr. Sharma. It was an excellent presentation as always. Uh, so now, 
I think it's time for a uh, few questions. Uh, I request the participants to uh, jot down the questions in the chat box. So yeah, it was really excellent the way you explained. Uh, we are well aware of the time constraints because one hour is definitely not enough with so many things to discuss. Yeah, I think I tried my best uh, to cover. I think uh, to cover most of the things is because this is much more than what it is uh, written in the Khan's book. So as I said in the very beginning, so it's slightly different than what it is written in the in the Khan's book. Uh, but uh, this is a complete overview of how the proton therapy works. Very true, sir. Okay, so uh, there is no question. Uh, there is one which is not really academic. Is when are you starting for your fellowships and training programs? Okay, uh, of course, I think uh, fellowship in the in radiation uh, in the medical physics or fellowship in uh, the radiation oncology. Uh, I think he is asking for both. Okay, okay. So in fact. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we have already we have already uh, done uh, for one of the the AROI fellowship. I think we have I think one uh, candidate from I think from Calcutta has already undergone the, the fellowship uh, in proton therapy. And of course, I think uh, there is uh, till now we have not formally declared the starting of a fellowship. But uh, depending upon the kind of request what we get, then our team may consider uh, the, uh, the suitability of the, the fellowship. OK. Uh, OK, so we have got one question. Uh, he's asking for 50,000 volt or 50,000 cycles. Uh, will it be a 2,500? MEV, so please clarify the okay, energy. That is about, that is about uh, what we call the, the, the number of times we have to uh, we have to subject the proton beam to pass through the, it's very simple mathematics, like uh, you have a potential difference of 50 kV and then you want to accelerate the proton having a unit charge up to 250 MeV, so it is just a division of the, the, the applied voltage divided by the, the required energy, and so that gives you the, the number of no. times you have to accelerate the SARS particle inside that potential difference. Okay, okay. So, any other questions? I don't, I don't, I have confused everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've explained it beautifully so that, I mean, <laughs> the other thing is that we keep on repeating is the participants better do a baseline reading uh, so then you can clear your doubts uh, during the class. Okay, uh, there is no question then, shall we close? Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. So thanks once again. Okay, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, yes, sir. It was really a pleasure uh, listening to you. Uh, so that's it for tonight. So good night and good goodbye. Night. Good night. Good night to all the participants. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.